Open stands for Organisation for Promotion of Environmental Needs and it started uh, because having lived here in the area and worked in the area for 20 years, I'd become completely disenchanted by how derelict the area had become, how businesses had been driven out of the area by the dilapidation and the number of fires that have been happening. I mean there's been something like six or seven fires in this street in the last 18 months on land that's been the subject of development proposals. So the area was looking like a, a Baghdad. It was a war zone and because the place was so derelict people were losing their sort of sense of civic pride in their area. The community was breaking down and so local residents and businesses approached me and said look what can we do about this and I suggested to them what we should do is form a community-based company. So that's what we've done. It's a democratic structure. Open was formed and we started campaigning at the beginning of last year, 2005. I was walking to work and I, I work just opposite the old entrance at number 12 Dawson Lane to the original 1886 circus. And I found that the entire site, including these two Georgian locally listed houses and the theatre building, had been surrounded by hoardings. And I asked the contractors for putting these hoardings up, what are you doing? And they said, well, we're putting the hoardings up because these buildings are going to be demolished in a couple of weeks. So I said, well, I haven't heard anything about this. Nobody's been consulted. There's been no planning application to demolish the buildings. Are you quite sure? And they confirmed it. So immediately I rang up English Heritage and asked them to come down and look at the buildings as soon as possible to see whether they merited listing. The advisor from English Heritage came down in May 2005 and she was shown around the theatre. She concluded that because of all the alterations and because of its poor condition, it didn't merit listing. So we began to investigate how it is that this building um, had got into such a bad condition. I met um, a local man called Newton Dunbar and he told me all about this club. The original four aces started in 1966 in Dawson Lane. We solely and singly promoted music. I've had the satisfaction of promoting quite a few great artists. It was a mainstream venue. I've been affiliated to the building for over 35 years. So I felt obligated to defend what its legacy would be. And I was able to supply him with some of the information that would be advantageous to his quest. He told me how in the early 90s... The roof over a large section of the club, which were slate tiles, was removed. And as a result, although they'd done their best to keep the building wind and watertight, water had got into the building and been coming into the building continuously since that time. There was a sign advertising these, these tiles for sale. These are things that one puts up with, you know. I was able to have a conversation with the person on the roof at the time and you know, who instructed him, etc., remains a matter of conjecture. But I know that nobody could have just done that off their own bat if they didn't have the backing of whoever. But I know my present landlord at the time must have given sanction to this happening. So I was very concerned about whether these buildings could be saved or not, and I contacted a structural engineer called Brian Morton. And Brian Morton um, is an internationally known structural engineer. He does, his firm does work all over the world. He's the structural engineer to Canterbury Cathedral, to Bury St Edmunds Cathedral. And after some months of negotiation with the council that owned the building, I eventually was able to get access and Brian Morton and I and Newton Dunbar and some others went into the building. 
And it was quite shocking to see how that building, the interior of that building, has been completely and utterly destroyed. And it's been destroyed by total neglect by the council in failing to look after it. They'd owned it for at least 20 years before the roof was removed and done nothing to it. It was quite obvious when the roof was removed because I remember I was working here at the time and I could look out of my office window and I remember seeing people on the roof. There's no secret about it. We all thought they were doing repairs, but the new roof never went on. It was originally built as a circus in an amphitheatre style and then in 1898 it was converted to a Victorian variety theatre and a new entrance was added on to the front of the existing circus entrance. And we've since discovered that that entrance is the earliest surviving circus entrance in the country. All the later examples are listed on the national statutory list. This one isn't listed. The building had had a massive amount of money spent on it in 1920s to convert it to a, what's called the Gaumont Cinema. They spent millions in today's money on the building and it was magnificent. It was the only really grand building in Dalston. Fortunately I then got a report from Brian Morton and his view is that although the interiors are destroyed, the structure of the theatre building is sound and certainly as far as the buildings fronting Dalston only concerned, that's the original entrances which are quite exquisite or were quite exquisite, and the two Georgian buildings, they're perfectly capable of restoration. However, our approach is to Hackney to try and agree to them doing a feasibility study for alternative uses for the site uh, were rebuffed. And I then discovered they, they put a demolition notice on the site in October of last year. So I made inquiries about that and they said they were going to make an application to the council planning department for approval to demolish. And I said, well, they wouldn't be entitled to that because uh, there is an exception to an owner's right to demolish buildings, which is where they're joint dwelling houses, as in this case, the two locally listed Georgian houses, um, and where the condition has been rendered unsafe due to the owner's neglect. And we say that's what happened here. In those circumstances, the law is that the owner must make a full planning application involving public consultation and a decision by the elected members of the council before any permission could be given to demolish them. And nevertheless, it appeared that Hackney intended to demolish without public consultation, without planning permission. So we applied to the High Court for injunction. So what OPEN did is it organised a public consultation campaign to see what our community's view was about these buildings and what should happen to the site. They should keep the heritage. It could be made up and they could put a library in there and a theatre and that's taking, you know, the youngster off the street as well. It's giving them something to do and it's, you know, we're right on their doorstep. I think I agree with what I've been already hearing, you know, if it has like an arts centre, especially for such an area, it's so rich. I would like to see a development that would represent the diverse population, the diverse community interest that is, well, not only providing work for people but also having a mixed development that will comprise housing, not just housing for the Yorkies, but housing for everybody. Our nearest decent sports centre is in Islington. We want basketball courts, we want stuff that the kids in the community can get into. A lot of the community centres are closed down now. I mean, what, what's the council doing about that, you know? So those are the things that the people really want. And what was clear is that our community prefers to reuse historic buildings that are part of the character of the area. Also, the greatest need 
for housing in this borough, in, in this area, it's for family housing. The other thing people uh, were objecting to is this kind of cloned high street style where you get brand names, brand national brand names coming in and just reproducing their brand, their image in an area so that the existing character of the area, the diversity in the area is no longer apparent. And the other effect of these national brands coming in is because they can afford higher rents. Local businesses get driven out. And that was another concern. Another major concern is that these buildings have been a center for entertainment in this area for 120 years, as a circus, as a theater, as a cinema, as a nightclub, as a center for black music culture. There are no proposals to replace any of these buildings with any cultural or arts facilities or entertainment facilities at all, except a library. We already have a library locally. And for drinking establishments, that is a bar. So there's nothing to meet the cultural and social and um, artistic needs of the community. And yet we're, we're a community which has a thriving cultural industries, arts, music, and, and yet there's nowhere for these, this creativity to be expressed and nowhere for people to go and enjoy all the creative things that are going on in Dalston. So there's another disappointment. Do we love Hackney? Hackney is transforming. We're going to get the first tube stations. We're going to get the first tube stations this borough has had ever by 2010. We're building five new mixed secondary schools. We're rebuilding all our existing secondary schools. For jobs, there's going to be more than a million square feet of the most high-tech workspace built over in the WIC as part of the Olympics. This borough is being transformed. There's an organisation called Bootstrap and they've put forward a proposal for about 250 to 300 homes which will all be affordable to local people and will also include a large green open space of which there are presently going to be, going to be none and will also include the restoration and reuse of the historic buildings on the site including the Georgian houses and the theatre and looking at the finances of that that seems to be in fact more affordable to the local authority than the present development proposals and that proposal has been put forward by Bootstraps and the Environment Trust uh, but the council have dismissed it because I think they made a decision over a year ago what was going to happen to this site and since that time they've been going through the consultation process ticking all their boxes uh, to arrive at the decision that they made 12 months ago. And so, uh, because there are very, very powerful forces at work with the Greater London Authority, the London Development Agency, the Office of the Deputy Prime Minister, it doesn't look as though the Bootstraps Environment Trust proposal has really had much of the most serious consideration. But it's certainly the proposal which, of all the plans that have been put forward, has the most community support. Because it actually meets the needs of the community in terms of social housing, in terms of cultural needs, in terms of open space, in terms of preservation of the architectural character of the area. The occupation by squatters, residential squatters, started sometime after the council evicted all the tenants. There was the Africa House, there was the Club Four Aces, there were the Labyrinth Club. And sometime after that, the corner building, numbers four and six Dolson Lane, came to be occupied by squatters who lived there, very quietly, no harm to anybody, at least they kept it wind and watertight. In October 2005, October last year, the council decided to chuck them out. And I was coming out of my office and I saw the council officers there at the door with police, physically removing the squatters. But for some days after that, uh, the, the council were in that building and eventually they put up the steel shutters and left. When the news got out that 
we'd had to agree to our first injunction being discharged. I came into work and found that the buildings had been occupied by eco-warriors. First of all, some leaflets from Open Dalston. People started to talk about occupying the theatre against demolition. And so when we heard that the demolition was imminent, um, we occupied the day before the, the builders went in. Before we'd even had a chance to go to sleep, as people were going to sleep, the, the builders and the, the, um, the security came in. At first we were in the whole building, but the builders broke in and pushed us out of, of the main bit of the theatre. Drove uh, a young woman, actually, who was in the theatre, up onto the roof of the theatre. And she was up on that roof of the theatre for the, the whole week in February when there were literally blizzards and hail. And she was up there um, keeping possession of the roof. What we found out when those occupiers had, had, had managed to take control of the buildings was that in October, when the council evicted squatters, the council had gone in there and stripped out the staircases from the ground floor to the top floor. They'd made that building uninhabitable. It was an act of vandalism. It was an act of demolition. And at that time, the council had no planning permission to demolish. They'd just gone ahead and done it. Um, they're a law unto themselves, and they'd made the building uninhabitable. The first and second floor, all the toilets and all the basins are smashed, which has been a bit of a problem for us. When we didn't have the staircase, that was a big problem. I know that the staircase was there because our structural engineer, Brian Morton, saw it and commented on it. And in fact, we went up the staircase to get onto the roof to, to look at the Georgian houses. So there's no doubt that it was Hackney that removed that staircase. And in fact, later in court proceedings, they admitted it. The eco-warriors who occupied in February set about rebuilding the staircase so that the building could be occupied. When I first came in, I thought, but what are we going to do with this? I thought the place is, is, is gutted, you know, it's, it's wrecked. I mean, I thought there's no, there's no stairs. The, this room was, was really awful, really dirty and horrible. Um, there was like nasty graffiti all over everything. And um, the, the place seemed to me just, you know, a ruin. But immediately we took the, the carpet off this room and painted the walls. Um, fixed broken windows, put them up. To build the stairwell was the hardest thing. It, it took us a week to build the staircase because, um, I mean, we didn't have any power tools. We were making the tables in the dark. We'd camp by candlelight, we were making the tables. It was amazing. What's amazing is that nobody lost a finger, but also the, the roof. A lot of tiles had been taken off the roof, uh, which meant that rain got in, pigeons have got in, um, so that has made the building deteriorate a lot. They've taken steps to restore the building, and yet the council is saying they've got to evict them because the building might be damaged. To me there's something really wrong about spending money to damage a building, especially, I mean, it's, it's public money as well, you know, and the fact that they've deliberately gone out to wreck the building, you know, is... The reality is they want to evict them so they can demolish the building themselves and destroy it. The corruption that's happening in Hackney Council and what they're trying to do to the properties and kind of, you know, not supporting the constituents they're trying, they're, that they're supposedly employed for, you know, and, and voted for by. And, you know, so against them trying to knock down this property because this is, you know, an historic property. First of all, because we had the banners on the roof, you could tell that something was happening. And then as soon as possible, we started to make leaflets and hand them out in the street, which wasn't always easy to get people to take leaflets in the cold and in the dark and the rain. So people can kind of come in and, and people are welcome and we give people free tea and coffee and stuff and, and whatever we have. We got in touch with the people from Open Dalston and they they started coming around from the first day to see us. Well, the eco-warriors have been uh, brilliant in the sense that their occupation raised the public profile of the issue very considerably. It attracted a lot of media attention. We've had a lot of people around. I mean, at first, people were a bit perplexed. Like, what, well, what's all this then? What's going on? What are you doing here? They've been running community events there. They've been having a cafe there. They've been having film shows there. They've tried to involve local people in making them aware of what's going to happen to the area. 
And that's also like shows, you know, there's a lot of people down here that really care, you know, about not just about this area, but the general issue of gentrification in general and like building strong communities. That's what this place has been in the last couple of weeks. That's what it's been all about. The council aren't really doing much for people in this area. It's time to do it for yourself, you know. That's, that's been the best thing about this, you know. There's nowhere for people to go and meet apart from a pub where people get drunk, you know. There needs to be places where people can come and talk to each other and talk about local issues. Because if people aren't talking, you can't have a community. And here you've still got that. Especially people who came at the beginning and then could see how much we'd improved the space. You know, I think that really got, got us quite a bit of support. And we had everyday people bringing us things, food and stuff. And, and equipment, tools, paint, paint rollers and... Um, furniture, blankets with, with a cooker, with heaters, gas bottle heaters. We've been living off donations here, you know, food and stuff that people have been bringing. Um, and, you know, that kind of restores your faith in humanity in a way because you realise people, when it comes to it, we'll group together and we'll help each other out, you know, and that's what's been happening here. That should be kind of encouraged, not, not taken away, you know, which will happen if this building is, is knocked down. It might not go on for very long if, if we get evicted you know, in the next few days. It's a real shame if it goes because, you know, it's been a massive point of positivity for the last couple of weeks. You know, loads of different people coming inside offering support and just really lifting people's spirits. Definitely for myself, anyway, I've lived around here for about eight years now and uh, it's one of the best things I've seen happen in the area. It sorely needs like a focal point for the community and a place where people can mix and share ideas and that's what's been happening. Eventually the council took possession proceedings um, against them in the High Court. This all happened so fast because Hackney Council are desperate to get rid of us. And they used a particular procedure which is an emergency procedure for, uh, which enables them to use the police to evict squatters where there is a risk of damage to property or harm or pu public disorder. They didn't even realise that they're not allowed to take us to the High Court for an interim possession order. The judge in the High Court was satisfied that it wasn't the squatters who were, who were putting um, the building at risk. And it wasn't the squatters whose activities might cause a breach of the peace. And on that basis, he dismissed the case. He said, I'm not hearing this. Go to the county court. So we're in Shoreditch Court tomorrow. Um, which is a bit annoying. We hoped that it would buy us some more time so we could do some more um, stuff here and build up more support with the local community and stuff to save in this place and actually, you know, stopping Hackney Council to do this in, in a number of other places like they've already been doing. It's not looking very good for us, to be quite honest, because we don't have a legal right to, to occupy this place. Um, you know, there's obviously moral reasons. <laughs> In court case yesterday, Council applied for an interim possession order in Shoreditch County Court um, on the basis that the people in occupation are trespassers and have no right to be there. And the judge said the reason they want possession is so they can begin demolition of the building. That court order would have entitled the, the, the Council to call on the police to chuck everybody out because it's a criminal offence to disobey that particular kind of court order. We will risk um, six months imprisonment. Um, for staying here. The possession order was made, I, I was given a copy of it, um, and I came here in the evening and I found a number of these possession orders had been stapled up onto the hoardings. We have the eviction notice saying that we must leave today. Uh, we don't know what is, is going to happen, but I think that we're still in pretty good spirits. But unfortunately for the council, uh, there was a bit of an oversight and they forgot to serve some of the documents of the property within time, and as a res result of that, um, they lost their right to call on the police to evict the occupiers. And in fact, since then, um, in the last three months, they've taken no steps to evict the occupiers at all. And the reason they've done that is that they won't evict them until they've actually got the High Court injunction removed and entered into the demolition contract um, so that they can then demolish the building. And the concern then is that that decision won't be open to challenge. Uh, we've challenged it previously on the basis that how could the committee say these buildings should be demolished when they don't know what's going to replace them. But now they will know because the planning application has been submitted to build a 20-storey tower block and a 10-storey tower block. And 
that will mean that the buildings will need to be demolished to, to create this new development. It's becoming increasingly difficult to find ways of challenging the council's decision to redevelop this site. There was a demonstration outside the town hall and people came with banners and posters and... They were up in arms against Agnes' plans. The basic theme of the demonstration was to save what heritage we have. And the view was, if, you know, you've got to save the past to save the future. Because the past is our children's and grandchildren's future. Well, what I had in council was, is this... Metropolis here, two 18-storey tower blocks. And you might remember that Hackney Council's in the Guinness Book of Records has been the largest ever client of explosive demolition in the world, blowing up tower blocks, because they said years ago there's no place for tower blocks in Hackney, and now they want to build tower blocks again. Great. We're given five minutes collectively to lodge our objections. Anyone who wants to lodge an objection has to divide up the same five minutes. It was an emotional meeting with the council limiting the number of people who are allowed into the public gallery by half the number of people who is possible to admit there. 30 people can go in, so I don't know if everybody wants to go in or if you want to kind of decide amongst yourselves who wants to go in and give a bit of support from the public gallery. Having security guards on the door to keep people out of the town hall. Waiting to see if they can count how many people are allowed in the public gallery now. <laughs> <laughs> After they just slammed the door in our faces without making yeah. an account. They might let more in, maybe up to 50. There's only apparently about 23 at the moment. There's a sign on that door saying, due to health and safety reasons, the public gallery capacity has been reduced to 30. <laughs> Whose health and safety is that, I wonder? <laughs> the meeting started, and fortunately, uh, one of the leaders of the community called Charles Collins, who I'd actually invited to speak to the members that night at the meeting, he was a few submissions. are speaking about, and I'm here to represent myself. So how can I not be in the meeting? I'm afraid the council's procedures state so that only people who are registered to speak... We registered But I am registered. My statement is in from last week. Can I have the solicitor, please? Bill, 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 Bill Davis, please. Is him he's the one who can take my statement, submit my statement, and, and commission me to be here. And he refused to accept that. I'm the 60s and I can't be there. I'm not the one Just be reasonable. Well, you're going to sign it, man. Don't touch me, man. Don't touch me, man. So eventually, he stormed up the stairs of the town hall. Burst into the council chamber. <laughs> followed by about 200 members of Open, supporters of Open, who managed to get admission to the public chamber. Space in that gallery. That gallery's half full. Save it for democracy. Right. What exactly is the problem here? We're not allowed in the gallery. Charles Collins spoke about his experience when he first founded the music club in Dawson and how they put on Little Stevie Wonder, for example, in 1966, and what a loss it would be to the history of culture in Dawson full stop if these buildings were demolished. And there were other speakers I spoke on behalf of members of Open. But that night, the council committee passed a resolution to demolish the buildings. And they did that on the basis of a report by the council's property services that they'd had all the buildings surveyed and found that none of them were capable of repair and reuse. We could win the battles, but we really couldn't win the war because the powers that be, they usually come out on top and they usually have the power to make what they stipulate happen. There will be 
a granite surfaced open space in a canyon between two 20-storey tower blocks, which will probably only receive full sun for about an hour a day. There's no permanent children's play provision that we can see, and they say that uh, the glazed balconies and a second and ninth floor roof terraces are play areas for children. Very recently, Hackney had quite a few tower blocks in the area, which they have subsequently demolished, and it was proven that tower blocks don't really work in most situations. There's maximising the amount of council tax they'll get for the site. They're maximising the amount of income they'll get by selling the homes on the site. Only 15% of the whole development will have affordable housing. But there's very little for the local community, and what the local community wants, or we say they want, is going to be destroyed, and, and that will be irreversible. That's money that's come from all of the people in this area, everyone you see around you at the moment, and it's just going on private, some sort of private enterprise. You know, it should be for the people of Hackney, that's why I'm involved with it, and that's why everyone here is involved. What Open would like to see um, is we'd like to see at least the frontages of the buildings on Dalston Lane restored because we think they lend great character to the area. That is what most of the community want and if those buildings are restored that will inform the new developments that are going to be built on the site because the new buildings will have to um, blend in a sense with the old buildings and so we also think that the theatre is capable of reuse and there is a need for cultural and arts facilities in Dalston. There is a need for green space in Dalston, including areas for children and areas for older people. Uh, quiet areas where people, once they've been shopping, they can get away from the hustle and bustle of a big shopping area which is going to be noisy and polluted. Having nighttime economy like uh, a theatre and other cultural venues will help provide security to people using the transport facilities at night. It will make it a more secure place, it will make people feel safer. Uh, the council's proposal basically is to have shops and that sort of thing which will close at five, six o'clock. And so when people go into this area to catch a train or a bus, there'll be nothing happening. I think they're going to be vulnerable, and that's worrying. If I send my daughter to get a train, or she's arriving on a train late at night, it would worry me, and it would worry any parent. The Transport for London site next door is looking less and less financially viable. Open received a letter from the Great London Authority which admits that Transport for London's development is going to make a loss. And the letter says that Transport for London will require cross-subsidy from the Hackney Council site. That is to say, Hackney Council will be financing a 20-storey tower block on the neighbouring site which is all for private sale. And what's emerged in the court proceedings that we've been taking is Hackney have said that Transport for London are insisting on the demolition of the historic buildings on the council site because the land value that will be produced by demolishing the buildings will be needed to fund the £19 million shortfall on building the concrete slab over the railway on which to build the tower blocks. So it looks as though not only is Transport for London getting central government money 10 million pounds to finance this loss-making scheme of theirs but they're also looking for 19 million pounds from the local authority that is council taxpayers that is me you and other members of our community why on earth Hackney council taxpayers would want to invest in that is a complete mystery to me I have no idea so our historic buildings are going to be demolished so that the land value Hackney council's land that Hackney council taxpayers have paid for is going to be used to fund a 20-storey private tower block on the Transport for London site. And our heritage, 
our architectural heritage is going to be destroyed. The social and cultural history is going to be destroyed. And Hackney is going to be blighted by these tower blocks. And it looks to me as though TfL have mugged Dalston and Hackney is going to pick up the tab because it's council taxpayers who are going to pay the, the losses that TfL are going to incur.